Hello everybody, my name is Ander Ramos. I'm a PhD student of Federal University of Ouro Preto. I'm here with Professor Ethan Kleinberg. Professor Ethan Kleinberg is professor of Wesleyan University. He is the director for the, of the Center for Humanities and the e executive editor of the journal History and Theory. Uh, so I, have, I had the opportunity to talk with Professor Kleinberg and the interview will, pub will be published soon. And now we're going to do a short preview of our interview. So it's a pleasure to have you here, Professor here, Kleinberg. Do this. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's, um, it's really wonderful to be here in Oro Preto and, and attending this event. And I have to say, um, I've met a number of professors and students, and I'm really excited about the work being done in theory of history and philosophy of history here in Oro Preto. It's, it's a great place. <laughs> really nice. So could you talk a little bit about could you talk a little bit about to us uh, about your thesis regarding the constraints of the analog ceiling? Sure. I, this is something uh, that I first talked about at the INTH conference in Ghent a number of years ago. And the basic idea is that constraints in publishing uh, are affecting the way we're able to imagine and think about theory and philosophy of history. And what I mean by this is that uh, even though there's a big push for us to do digital history or to publish digitally, the artifacts that are being published look almost exactly like the ones that were published 30 or 40 years ago. The article looks like an article. The monograph looks like a monograph. And this would be all well and good, except that I think it's had a really suffocating effect on the theory of history insofar as the way we think about the past and how the past works, the past as an object, uh, is, is much more complicated uh, and polysemous and in some ways chaotic than what comes out in the narrative realist model. And I, I call this a kind of ontological realism. And what I mean by that is within the narrative, uh, there's a sort of assumption that the past or the event has ontological properties, and if we simply have the right methodology, the right epistemology, we can go back and get it. And I, I don't think that's commensurate with the way we actually think about how the past works. So what I'm advocating for is actually to really try to crack this analog ceiling and to experiment on digital platforms to try and find new ways of using multiple narratives or multiple temporalities ways that really force us to confront the polysemous nature of the past. This is to say the way that the past is, is not controlled, it's often chaotic, and our tellings should be multiple as well to account for that, to account for, for the missing portions of the past that can reappear, for the latent ontology of the past. And so I, I can't say that I have a prescription of one way to write, but what I do advocate for is for us to let students use these new digital medium the new forms to really truly experiment in ways that, that reconcile with what's happening in theory and philosophy of history as how we understand the past, how we try to understand the past. <laughs> and Professor Kleinberg, what do you think about the future of the studies on the fields of theory of history and the history of historiography? Yeah, that's, that's a big and very good question. And I think it's, it's linked to the first one. Uh, clearly, I think the future is going to, to have to fully embrace the, these new modes and digital forms. Uh, and the, that's one of the places we really should be experimenting. We should be trying to, to see what it means to an archive when it's completely digitalized. We should be thinking about what it means to recreate a narrative. Uh, these are areas that I think are really exciting and younger students are working in it. The trick is to create a space to let them to keep working with them instead of restricting them to end up following the same template for how a history is written. But, but the other thing that's really exciting is right now for, for journals in philosophy and theory of history is really a boom time. And we have more readers. We have more submissions, certainly at History and Theory, but in other journals as well, like Rethinking History and Journal of Philosophy of History. It's clear that many, many people are excited about it. And this is especially true in places like Brazil and Argentina, but also China uh, and India. So I, I see the future of the theory and philosophy of history is precisely coming from people in areas like Brazil who are rethinking these coordinates unhinged, if you will, from the, the Western tradition. This is not to say they're not in dialogue with it, they absolutely are, and they know it very well, but they're applying it to other particular paths to try to understand and to press back against those models. 
I think that in turn is forcing scholars in the United States and Europe to also rethink how the theory of philosophy of history works, but also the nature of historiography itself. So to my mind, the future looks pretty good. <laughs> nice. So thank you, Ethan, to come here and to accept to do the interview <laughs> and to accept to do this call. And it was a pleasure for us. Well, the, the pleasure is mine. And, and I, I really do appreciate not only this brief moment of interview, but the longer interview we did. It was, a, it was great to, to sit down and work with you and really have a substantive discussion about what's going on. So, so for those interested in history, history of historiography and theory of history, this is a good opportunity to learn even more. So the interview will come out soon. And thank you for watching. Thank you.